So in terms of uh, the agenda today, we're going to talk about uh, the quantum marketplace updates. Uh, we've got some great news that just uh, just came out. Um, also, we're going to, you know, just going to touch really briefly on uh, the overview and trends in fabrication services. And then also, uh, you know, who's speaking today. And then also, you know, getting into the roundtable discussion and then a quick slide on upcoming webinar schedule. So the quantum marketplace is now public. You can, you don't have to be a member of QDC to see it. Uh, you know, and so the tagline phrase is, you know, what are you in the market for? You can type in quantummarketplace.org and it will take you there. This is what it looks like, just a snapshot from, from the website. Um, if the company has a video, you'll see a video icon next to the company. These are companies that have presented in the past in the quantum marketplace. Uh, <clears throat> and we're now live on YouTube. So we now have a live public YouTube channel with all the videos and presentations from the past. Um, there's quite a few already. Um, we have them ordered. Uh, we don't have the timing ones up yet from last month, but we have the entangled photon sources from August and cryogenic from July, um, and then <clears throat> sensors and uh, lasers, et cetera. So some quick slides on some overview and trends that are happening in the marketplace. Now we're seeing you know, various entities are providing access to their state-of-the-art quantum enabling fabrication services. These can mostly comprise of shared user facilities, such as universities, et cetera, and then also some purpose-built facilities. So, so what does that look like? So in terms of shared user facilities, you know, this gives you access to leading edge R&D, uh, very flexible to work with. And then also some of the you know, purpose-built FAP facilities enabling quantum technologies, and we're gonna get this into this a lot more in the panel discussion, uh, but the, some of them have excess capacity and they're making that available to outside customers. Also, many of them uh, have experience getting to high uh, TRL uh, and also can provide, you know, when you go to production, they can, they can provide merchant supply. So with that, I want to get into the lineup. Um, so first, we're going to have John Randall from Zyvex Labs. Then we're going to have Tim Day from DRS. Then we're going to have Sherry from MIT, um, and those are going to make up, you know, the pure providers in the spectrum. Uh, and then also we're going to have uh, Dirk from Equal One and Daniel from Seek, and we're going to have Yuja uh, join us from Rigetti in the panel discussion only. But the, they make up a, an interesting bunch that they actually use some of the tech that they're also uh, selling to others. So. Let's get right into John Randall's presentation. John, can you uh, share your slides? I will try to do that. Uh, you have to, there, there, there we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as advertised, I'm John Randall. I'm very happy to speak with you at this quantum marketplace presentation, tell you about what Zyvex Labs may be able to do for you. What we provide is the highest resolution and precision lithography technology that's out there anywhere. We call it uh, hydrogen depassivation lithography. It's actually a strange uh, cousin to e-beam lithography done with a scanning tunneling microscope. It's automated, it's sub nanometer resolution, and we provide atomic precision. Uh, if you're gonna make, uh, uh, quantum devices, you need some quantized energy states. If you wanna create those, you can, for instance, create uh, some quantum dots. We're gonna take the example of 26 nanometer size quantum dots. Um, the uh, equation there shows a, a simplified calculation for the energy levels of quantum dots in a size D. So for 26 nanometer uh, quantum dots, if you're gonna go with semiconductor lithography, you can use EUV and produce 26 nanometer quantum dots. Unfortunately, the uh, sloppiness of semiconductor lithography uh, produces plus and minus 6.5% uh, uh, deviation in size, and that smears out the, the area where those that first and second quantum state may be. It, with hydrogen depassivation, depassivation lithography, HDL, it is much more precise, and the energy spread is tiny 
compared to what you can get with uh, the current other lithography techniques. Uh, so this is hugely advantageous if you're trying to make uh, complex quantum devices such as quantum computers or other uh, uh, complex solid state quantum devices. Uh, now, if you don't have the $250 million it takes to make uh, to buy an ASML EUV scanner, you're probably going to use e-beam lithography to try to make your small devices. But we have a, a huge advantage even over the very best that e-beam lithography can offer. Uh, this, uh, the yellow data is from a Carl Bergman paper from a few years ago. Uh, and uh, the red is a model, but very well supported by experimental data for hydrogen depassivation lithography. It is just a ridiculously sharper tool. Um, now, it's also a relatively slow tool, an STM uh, with a single tip is good for research, and as I'll point out, a number of groups are using it for research in quantum devices, but for manufacturing, we're going to have to significantly up the throughput. Happily, by going, we were working to produce MIMS scanners as opposed to piezoelectric scanners, and in a paper we published a couple of years ago, we've shown that not inventing anything new, just doing some uh, not trivial, but uh, straightforward engineering, we can put something like 7 million STM scanners on a 300 millimeter wafer. And the STM scanners being smaller, higher resonant frequencies can scan at least 10 times as fast. What you're seeing there is an image showing uh, atomic resolution imaging uh, at 10 times the speed you can normally get for with a uh, piezoelectric scanner. Now, as I mentioned, it's currently, <laughs> technology is currently being used to develop quantum devices uh, the list of uh, places on the left are where our tools are sitting. There are other scanning tunneling approaches to uh, hydrogen depassivation lithography. For instance, uh, Rick Silver, our collaborator at NIST, is making analog quantum simulation devices with this technology. And you see a two dot and a nine dot. It's roughly equivalent uh, uh, little dots of uh, uh, phosphorus dopants. And he's doing electron transport through there, showing strongly correlated uh, electron transport, tra uh, which is a great way to study uh, Fermi Hubbard physics and some other uh, physics Hamiltonians in a way that you just can't do with uh, uh, cold atoms or trapped ions. We at Zyvex are also working on making ultra high performance 2D bipolar junction transistors that we believe will work very well in the cryogenic uh, temperatures of a quantum computer backplane. Uh, if you want to get to higher precision faster, uh, we can do, we've shown that we can make hydrogen, use HDL to make uh, nano imprint templates working with SD Srinivasan, uh, at least proof of principle. Those should be able to make with a much higher throughput, uh, a wide variety of products, including quantum devices. Uh, I just want to uh, leave you by saying that if you are making quantum devices, you will benefit from improved precision resolution. Uh, the uh, picture here is to suggest that if you're using e-beam lithography, you're kind of stuck with more like the big paintbrush with hydrogen depassivation lithography, a fine art paintbrush. Before I forget, we can also help you out with nano positioning issues if you have them. Let me end by saying that we are looking for development partners and investors. Uh, that's my time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, John. So just a quick question. So in terms of hydrogen depassivation lithography, having 150x higher precision than semiconductor lithography, why is this capability so important for quantum devices? Uh, quantum devices are incredibly sensitive to size, uh, uh, unlike uh, conventional CMOS, which uh, is digital uh, electronics and can live with very poor relative precision. Quantum devices, as I, as I showed in the simulations, very small deviations push those quantum states around. Uh, I, I have experience in this uh, back uh, 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 20 years ago making quantum tunneling, resident tunneling devices. And if you don't have just ridiculously good control of the, the features, you don't have control of the quantum states, which means you cannot make complex quantum devices. Great, great. Thank you, John. Okay, Tim Day, you're up. All right, Mark, let me pull it up. Good to, good to see everybody here. I'm Tim and I'm with uh, DRS Daylight Solutions. Is that coming through, my slides showing? Yeah, good, just presentation mode, yep. There we go. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what we'd like to do is kind of introduce uh, DRS Daylight Solutions and what we do and what we're providing in this kind of quantum fabrication services. 
Uh, Daylight's a little bit further up the food chain. What we do is design, develop, uh, transition to production, laser sources and subsystems that can be used in quantum information sciences. So if full service from the design side, transitioning all the way into production, if we look at the quantum ecosystem across the board, there's a strong need for lasers and sources generally that have frequency stable and intensity stabilized uh, capability. Uh, the team that we've put together, we've been here for about 17 years with well over 100 years of experience in transitioning semiconductor laser technology into subsystems that go into systems. We're vertically integrated with design of the uh, semiconductor gain media itself, fabrication, full capability, but more than that, the ability to integrate micro optics with it and do the processing and packaging and setting up a pilot line that allows one to generate these stable sources and subsystems that can be used, whether you're doing quantum sensing or quantum computing. The experience really is to transition from components with very high TRL. Uh, we're at TRL 9 in many cases. We've transitioned these semiconductor laser based uh, systems into full rate production with MTBFs well over 7,500 hours, integrating visible and near IR, shortwave IR, and even midwave and long wave. We've done devices from the UV all the way out to uh, 12,000 nanometers. But more importantly, we can design the dye at the dye level to include um, DFBs, DBRs, uh, integrate then those chips with on chip amplifiers, switches, et cetera, and then hybridly package them with very, very low swap, robust micro optics, whether they be modulators for. Uh, modulating and pound overhaul locking, closing the loop, temperature control, wavelength control, and integrating them into the system. So the services we provide is that engineering services to understand your system's application and transition it all the way into production uh, by doing rigorous you know, engineering uh, flow down of requirements into the modules that are necessary. This is an example of the kind of thing that the, the quantum ecosystem could benefit from. Uh, shown up here on the upper left is an example of a very small form factor, um, hybridly integrated, high TRL, robust package with multiple semiconductor gain media inside the package, wavelength A, wavelength B, with the ability to integrate into those die, as I said, grading stabilization, DBRs, DFBs, modulators, et cetera all the micro optics necessary to get multiple wavelengths coming out of the package, uh, doing frequency control if necessary, doing multiple wavelengths if necessary, doing broad tuning if necessary with high frequency control or low frequency control, jamming you know, dozens of dye into one very small footprint. But the approach is a comprehensive approach working closely with the systems integrators to identify what is your system? Do you want to have a quantum source and a rack mount? Do you want to use it in a clock? Do you want to use it in a PNT application? We integrate frequency control <laughs> into the box, uh, call it a part in 10 of the sixth to a part in 10 of the seventh of uh, wavelength stability, but then go and integrate electromechanical, optical, and integrated packaging and do it in a way that transitions to commercial production shown here as a pilot line of a multi-sources with passive wavelength stabilization, temperature control, uh, electrical control, all integrated into a commercial manufacturing line. The end result being a pilot line that you can then procure uh, exactly the source that you need for your system. So this is what we think uh, will be very necessary, whether your wavelengths are 360 nanometers or 639 nanometers or 1013 nanometers or all the way up into uh, even longer wavelengths. What Daylight can do is go down into the fab, design the die, design it optimally with an eye towards the integrated module, develop a pilot line to develop those modules so that they can work in your system. Uh, so that's what uh, we're offering uh, to this community. Um, we'd be happy to work with your teams to optimize the sources. The end result is sources that look very much like these small gold boxes 
and uh, we'd be happy to talk further about it. Great, thank you, Tim. It's really great to see DRS Daylight get into this uh, space, um, especially with your proven track record in high TRL, laser gain media, and, and photonic integrated packaging. Um, you know, where do you see DR DRS Daylight doing the, you know, helping the most in terms of impacting quantum in applications, so to speak? Well, I think probably the, the best way that we can help is put together these sources and subsystems that involve stable uh, frequencies and stable amplitudes in a very small footprint with a very high reliability. So addressing the need to scale it uh, from kind of research grade sources and subsystems into commercial sources and subsystems. These modules that I'm showing kind of right here where you have frequency stability of a part in 10 of the seven, but you have hooks to close the loop uh, so that you can even do uh, greater active stabilization, have 10,000 hours of lifetime, incredibly small swap, can be manufactured in a robust modular way. And if the quantum ecosystem, as it develops, it needs to have commercial, scalable, high reliability, low swap subsystems. And I think that's where we can help the best. Great, great, thanks, Tim. Okay, Sherry, you're up. Hey. Let me see if I can. Do you see this? Yes. All right. Okay, All right. go ahead. All right. Hi, I'm Sherry Agascar from MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and I'm going to be talking about our fabrication and integrated photonics capabilities. Uh, for those of you that don't know, MIT Lincoln Laboratory is a federally funded research and development center that works on developing and uh, applying advanced technology for problems of national security and economic competitiveness. And we really conduct R&D activities from long-term technology development to rapid prototyping. And our goal is to work broadly with the national community, government, industry, academia, and not-for-profits to solve difficult problems in the national interests. Um, one of our main facilities in terms of that technology development is our microelectronics laboratory. This is a DOD trusted ISO 9000 certified 90 nanometer CMOS line. And we really aim to work kind of to bridge the gap between what you can do in a university clean room, which may be very flexible, but is not necessarily particularly mature or stable, and what's available in industry clean rooms, which is you know, very mature and stable processes, but that may not have the flexibility you need when you're doing sort of earlier stage research and development. And we are the most advanced silicon-based fabrication facility in the country that's dedicated to supporting government needs. Um, so, you know, what do we what do we make in this fabrication facility? We make a number of things, and we're always interested in developing new ones. Um, some of the key ones are shown here. They include, you know, CCD imagers, um, cryogenic and radiation-hard CMOS uh, circuitry, superconducting electronics, MEMS, and micro fluidics and you know um, gallium nitride on, on silicon and integrated photonics. And I'm going to focus a little bit in on uh, integrated photonics for the rest of the talk. We are a vertically integrated, integrated photonics uh, house. We do everything from um, component and circuit design to control algorithm development. So you can run the thing once you've made it. Uh, as I mentioned, we also do you know fabrication. Uh, in addition to our CMOS fabrication, we have a compound semiconductor lab. We do 3.5 fabrication and we can do some other things as well. And we have a packaging laboratory so that we can you know bomb things up for use in a in a system. And that includes you know fiber uh, and wire bonding. And we have a, a full test lab. Um, that has you know, optical testing over a number of wavelengths from the near UV well into the infrared, uh, as well as electrical testing, which depending on the, the wavelength can get out into the tens of gigahertz. So we've you know, worked with uh, other people to take projects from you know, the drawing board all the way through to you know, a tested uh, module. Um, but we also have worked with many people on just one piece of this, depending on what their particular needs are. You know, we're really here to, to help the community kind of, kind of make progress. Uh, and to, to fill in the, the gaps where people may have needs. Um, I did want to highlight a couple of our integrated photonics uh, you know, platforms that, that we support and that we're happy to, to talk to people about getting access to. Um, the two main ones are that I'm, you know, are up here at the top. One of them is a, a visible light platform that covers from the near UV out into the near IR. And over the last few years, we've developed a large passive component library at uh, many different wavelengths in, in, in that range. And we're working on actually just being able to span that range completely. 
Uh, and we also have some more recent work on, on active devices if you uh, look up some of our papers. Uh, the other main platform that we've been working on a lot lately is a silicon nitride platform uh, for 1550 nanometers. This has thermal phase shifters in it. It has 0.1 dB per centimeter loss. And this is a very mature platform that we've been running uh, many times a year for, for multiple years. Um, in addition to those two platforms, we have a number of you know, sort of add-ons that we've been developing, including you know, pick and place uh, component integration for lasers and photodetectors, an ultra low loss, low confinement silicon nitride, um, as well as bonded thin film materials, especially lithium niobate. And then separately, we do have the silicon photonics, sort of a standard silicon photonics process that we run. And we, we often use that as uh, something that we integrate monolithically or combine with other platforms like our silicon nitrides platform or like a MEMS platform. Um, and so if you're interested in any of this, whether it's the platforms or you know, design or testing or fabrication needs, um, there are a number of different ways to partner with us. Uh, I wanna start by being very upfront about what we can and cannot do. We are happy to provide uh, R&D work and we can you know, provide units for, for R&D and units for the government, but we are not a merchant supplier. Um, we do, however, have the ability to license our IP or technology transfer things to merchant suppliers, uh, should that be a desire. And you know, depending on what you want to do and, and who you are, there are a variety of different you know, contracting options that are, are listed out on this slide. And if you are, are interested, our, our contact information is on, on the bottom, and a good uh, first point of contact is to email the MEL director uh, at, at LinkedIn. Um, Great. Thank you, Sherry. So, so you know, wow, you, you, MIT Lincoln Labs has a really state-of-the-art fab with a wide array of quantum enabling fabrication capabilities. So when small business and industry are not able to access component and services, they really should be reaching out to you, right? From the commercial okay, aspect. So. Um, we, yeah. we definitely are, are interested in talking to people who are, are you have needs that they, they haven't been able to find. Um, could, you, could you expand on um, sort of what, what you see people coming to you for that's not available in the commercial marketplace right now, at least for an R&D where you help them out? Yeah, it depends on it depends on the person. I mean, I think visible light photonics is something that's just starting to become available, depending on like who you are and what you need. Um, I, we've had some interest in low loss uh, silicon nitride. Um, we've had a lot of interest in some of our lasers um, that we we develop. That's we've partnered with people on on that, uh, as well as you know we've had some interest in some some non quantum things like beam steering. Um, so we we really do a lot of different things, and it, it depends on the person. And, and what their, their needs are. Great, thank you, Sherry. Okay, Dirk, you're up. All right, so let's get shared here. Okay, uh, so my name is Dirk Leipold. I'm the CEO of Equal One. We are a silicon quantum computing startup and the silicon kind of stuff we're doing is really electronic quantum dots integrated with large amount of electronics. And the talk today is especially to try to get interest into an industry consortium to be formed, which is helping with providing isotopically pure silicon. Um, so we are basically trying to build uh, desktop quantum computer platforms. We're doing this today based on commercial CMOS processing. That obviously is limiting the kind of qubit accuracy we can get. So we got our first demonstrator running last year with 95% gate accuracy. And uh, we're now having a hybrid qubit platform, which we're currently building. You see a photo here of something we recently turned on. And the idea is really to get all the way to where you might have even personal quantum computers. And we think we can deliver this in a couple more years here. Um, the key thing is that you kind of hold back here in the quality of the qubit gate accuracy. And we are overcoming this by integrating massive amount of electronics. And if somebody's interested in this part of the quantum computers, you're very welcome to contact us on what our machine can do today and how we actually integrated it into a neural hey, network platform. Set up for now. You rock, um, the second thing which we're having here yeah, is that we're basically because we're using yeah, conversion. Andy, please CMOS mute, data. Andy. Uh, because we're using commercial CMOS technology, 
uh, where we're basically uh, building our quantum dots out of the silicon films available and living with the quality we get and the stability levels we can get. Uh, we're obviously using natural silicon, so that's a mixture of multiple isotopes. We also have in this process actually the PMOS transistor as a silicon germanium device, and in both of these uh, things you have a mixture of isotopes, and there are some isotopes, uh, for instance, silicon 29, which is actually having a nuclear spin that coupling to your actually spin in your spin qubit, and that basically muddies the water and basically kills your qubit performance. If you're looking at what that effect actually does to you, you see it here. You basically would have the yellow line if you would have isotopic pure silicon. And if you are stuck with the natural silicon, you're stuck at the blue line. Now, you see that there are experiments available where some of these wafers are available today, but there are very few in between and are not available in a commercial CMOS process. And one of the reasons is that all the silicon 28, which is currently used worldwide, actually comes from Russia. I think we all can agree that's not a very beautiful <laughs> idea. So we actually should get some local resources to get silicon 28 and also the germanium 74 to actually get this isotopic pure performance available to a broader sector of people. Um, and so basically, uh, uh, what, what we did is that we were getting in contact and actually, obviously, we have a beautiful infrastructure in place, especially the Department of Energy has in Oak Ridge laboratories quite some capabilities to actually make this isotopic pure silicon. And so we have some collaboration with SLAC, which is a DOE lab, and SLAC actually is helping us to get the project uh, off the ground here. And it looks like DOE would be willing to be our sponsor and actually make MPW runs available. So what we contacted so far is Global Founder. He says, yeah, I mean, we support this. If he can get our hand on this material, we surely would do an FDX 22 run for you where you actually can have in a commercial process the right isotopic pure silicon. We talked to Soytech, which could provide the semiconductor wafer manufacturing, and they might be a part of the party here. If you have somebody else who can make fully depleted SOI wafer 300 millimeter ready for Global Foundry to consume, please contact me. I'm very willing to work with them. Intel says they definitely need the silicon 28 and the germanium 74. And they were talking about that they need in excess of 10 kilogram per year, which is actually a large quantity. Um, IBM was quite supportive. I think there's going to be a lot of people interested. So what we really try to get done here with my speech today is that we set up an email group, silicon28 at equal1.com. Um, we would like to hear from you if you are interested in these services. We would like to basically form a strong consortium and we want to get organized so that we get funding. And I'm pretty sure the way I'm observing this uh, it will be not a problem to make sure that you can source the silicon 28 wafer as conveniently as you today source your standard silicon if we get this project running with help from the government. Great. Thanks, Dirk. So, wow, you're building a personal quantum computer. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, your first demo to system working. I mean, it's not the greatest quantum computer on earth, but it's it lives within the constraints I have. But uh, because of my technology allows you to integrate, um, we already have 224 quantum dots on a single chip. And we're thinking the production chip we're doing for next year, we're trying to hit the million qubits node on a single chip and that will be possible because it's relatively easy to scale up and also because we because we have this bad silicon we can temperature wise work around three kelvin that allows you to actually have massive integrations or we're working on a chip which would realize a neural network with uh, 100 million weights integrated great so, uh, great thanks dirk okay daniel you're up Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, so my name is Daniel uh, Johannes. I'm the director of fabrication at, at, at SIG. 
Uh, here we have our website. Uh, um, sorry, I, I, I'm getting. Yeah, so uh, today I'm representing SIG to share with you what uh, we can offer as a provider of fabrication services. This uh, service is uh, complementary to SIG QC's uh, six core business, which is development of quantum computing products. SIG uh, is a quantum computing company geared to building uh, uh, application specific quantum, quantum systems. The approach uh, we are taking is to make a system on chip qubit control and redox circuits that are uh, that are integrated into a qubit, into a qubit circuit with a multi chip module setup, as you can see in this in these pictures here. This chip's uh, uh, central to this, but central to this development effort is a chip fabrication facility. This is because the development inherently requires a, a iteration of uh, chip design and and then fabrication and testing and, and to 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 engineer high high fidelity quantum systems. Besides our own needs, uh, we uh, the the facility has more than enough capacity to to process custom uh, chips um, uh, in, in a custom fabrication run. And for, for compatible processes, uh, we aggregate chips into wafer run containing chips with multi multi project to help reduce the cost. So SIG facility encompasses more than 4,000 square foot of clean room area. Uh, and most of the equipment are configured to accept 150 millimeter wafer diameter. About half of the, the clean room area is dedicated for thin film deposition of metals and dielectric. Uh, the photography, the photolithography area uh, houses a 5X reduction stuffer with a quarter micro resolution. And we have in the same room, we have in the same area, we have a 1X laser writer, which can go up to 0.6 micron feature sizes. Uh, we use various gases uh, to, to, and, and, uh, and, uh, and plasma configurations to do etching of metal and dielectric. We also have, uh, have capability to do uh, chemical, mechanical transition to add more layers. Uh, uh, as well as uh, we have various uh, cleaning and inspection setups uh, for checking uh, fabrication quality. Uh, SIG has a number of uh, uh, standard modular fabrication uh, processes for making chips of various complexity and applications. The classification is based on the number of subconducting layers, like starting from one or two to all the way to nine we've tried at, at our facility. And then the type of application that we're trying to uh, to uh, to achieve to to give so it's like either quantum or classical type, we have uh, we have delivered chip starting yeah, as I said from two to all the way to nine superconducting layers. Shown here is like a rendering of our SFQ class uh, U chip with five superconducting layers. Uh, like the there's a ground plane and one uh, under the ground plane we have this uh, high kinetic inductance layer. Uh, for uh, yeah, and then it's, yeah. So this 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 is our own uh, internal uh, releases that we do use. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have uh, uh, custom fabrication processes tailored to customer needs, with the only requirement of material uh, being compatible to our our processes. Uh, in terms of uh, customers, here I summarize uh, the processes and the TRL levels of different various products that SIG has de uh, delivered to in the past two and a half years. At TRL7, we have uh, prom two prominent products. These are the sensors for cosmic microwave background detectors and a scanning speed microscopy. This, these are uh, two products shown here. These products were delivered to US government and academic and commercial customers. Our internal qubit control uh, are at TRL uh, level five. This is the one I showed earlier, the rendering. We also have delivered chips to, another, to, another, to other US, uh, US government customer that is interested in readout t, uh, of TES sensors, detectors that is at TRL level four. Uh, and we, are, uh, we have uh, here on list, we have also a number of products that are delivered that are simply, we don't know their TRL levels. Uh, uh, but our, our, our commercial side uh, customers include Northrop Grumman, Limiter wave uh, systems, Raytheon BBN. Uh, from the US government, we have dealt with uh, DOE, LBNL, NASA, Air Force. And some of our academic customers include uh, various universities like uh, University of Connecticut, 
Cornell, NYU, and uh, UMass Boston, Colgate University, uh, and uh, UC Berkeley, to name some. Last but not least, uh, CQC uh, foundry is available for customers who need fabrication of superconductor, uh, classical, uh, quantum electronic circuits, sensors, and based on this, based on compatible materials. And you can reach us at uh, uh, infoseek.com and uh, and also you can give, get more information about the company at seek.com or and also we have a foundry separate website for the foundry seekfoundry.com thank you great thank you daniel so although seek is a quantum computing company it already has a healthy business providing fabrication services to so semiconductor classical and quantum electronic circuits, sensors, et cetera. So which customer application areas of quantum do you think could most benefit from your services? Oh, oh yeah, so it's mostly the uh, superconducting based uh, uh, quantum services. So, so at, at present, uh, we, what we're offering uh, as we speak is uh, we can make the ground planes for the quantum uh, the qubits. Uh, so the other part we're still developing, uh, like the make, make the junctions, but uh, yeah, so we have, uh, we have a solid uh, material, uh, material list that people can choose from. Uh, yeah, and then, yes, yeah. Yes. Okay, great, great, thank you. All right, so uh, you, Raj, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, great. So. I'm gonna kick it off the panel discussion with you. So in terms of access, so it, I find it curious that, you know, some quantum computing companies with purpose-built dedicated quantum device foundries are looking to provide foundry service to other players. Can you expand on why that is? Sure, uh, so for the folks that don't know, you know, Rigetti Computing is a vertically integrated QPU manufacturer, right? So we have our own fab, that's a purpose-built for superconducting device manufacturing. Um, and as we, you know, over the years, as we improved our processes and device yield, we found that we had a lot of excess fab capacity, right? And um, the, through our various collaborations with academic partners, uh, SQMS, uh, you know, research institutions across the country, we found that um, a lot of these folks were, were being hamstrung by the cycle time and lack of device repeatability when using, uh, you know, a shared user facility, such as a university clean room, for example. Um, and we wanted to, to help them get further, faster in their research. You know, a lot of folks, they're not strictly researching uh, quantum integrated circuit fabrication processes. They're playing around with novel qubit designs or novel control schemes or new two qubit gates that they want to mess around with. And they don't want to um, have to worry about, you know, is if I make five devices, are the frequencies going to be all in the same range? Is the device going to be repeatable? Um, so that's where we can come in. You know, we've developed a fairly repeatable process that we use for our own QPU manufacturing. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, we wanna help these researchers get further faster uh, in their own work. Great, great. So Daniel, can you comment on this as well since Seek is also a quantum computer company? Uh, uh, so sorry, what was, uh, uh, I was just reading. Well, so the question the... is, you know, so why are you, why is, is Seek offering uh, these services, um, you know, you built your purpose-built fab to uh -huh. support your quantum computing uh, right. effort, right? But you have, so why are you, is it because you have excess capacity? Yeah. Uh, what, that, why are you doing it? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I understand. Yeah, so yeah, we have excess capacity. And as you know, if, uh, the foundry runs continuously 24 hours a day, you know, 360 days a week, um, a year, sorry. And then, uh, I mean, there is excess capacity there to, to have, and then, um, so as I mentioned, as long as it does not disrupt our own uh, our activities, uh, we, we are happy to accept uh, you know, uh, services for, quant for quantum and classical applications. So uh, yeah, so that, that our main drive is like basically, you know, we have this extra, extra capacity, you know, let's use it and kind of maybe generate some, some, some revenue for, for you know, supporting the foundry activities as well. Yeah. So do you see that as a, as a short-term thing or do you see that as a, as a, as a, as a longer, um, you know, providing superconducting devices, for example, do you see that as, as a longer term sort of merchant supply to other players? Do you see that as long-term or short-term? Yeah, I think as a long-term, yeah. So we have, we, we, yeah, the SIG, the, as, as, you, as you can see, so SIG has its own, uh, you know, path for, you know, developing quantum, quantum computing applications. 
but the foundry kind of also has come some freedom to to you know to be to be able to continue supporting uh, uh, foundry activities yeah so it okay. could be a long term activity yeah. great and then and then Dirk I know this doesn't necessarily address your point totally but but uh, you know you are working to put a consortium together to go out and get this hyper pure silicon. Are you looking for other uh, partners or fabs to work with on that besides Global Foundries, or are you only going to work with Absolutely, foundries? I think I think you you want to have a relatively wide availability of these things. I mean, we're actually kind of like the fabless guys. We're kind of like user of this multi-project way for service, and you constantly have to ask yourself, how do you, what kind of dependency on your supplier you can live with, right? You need to have a very good relationship with them. And if you're looking at like on the silicon side, the amount of silicon we're consuming as quantum computer guys is laughable, right? I mean, if compared to, to the silicon consumption we have on the normal, side you see that for a fab you never a serious customer in this sense right you never is uh, consume enough silicon to be really relevant and so it makes total sense what the other gentleman said here that the fab is completely underutilized with the couple of quantum chips you need to actually get your first quantum computer working right so we will have this valley of death actually for the manufacturers where there is not enough loading there to make it competitive. I mean, right. a serious semiconductor machine produces 500 wafers per hour, <laughs> 300 yeah. millimeter diameter. That's right. very hard to swallow if you don't have a big consumption on the other end. Yeah, 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 great. Um, and just Tim Day, do you want to uh, talk about what, why you're? Or do you have excess capacity as well at DRS? I realize that's not a, a foundry, but um, a, 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 excuse me, a superconducting foundry, but it is a photonics gain chip uh, facility, right? Oh, it is. We, uh, you know, the uh, so daylight. I tried to answer it in the chat as well. It's a full fledged semiconductor laser foundry with the ability to go all the way down into 635 nanometers and above. So nearly any wavelength that we've come across that's needed in the quantum community, you know, will fall in the range somewhere between 635 and, you know, call it uh, two microns, if you will. And that whole spread of um, wavelengths can be done from epi growth with you know full mocvd capability two different reactors all the way through etch and prep processing and test and attach and wire bonding and dicing and air coating and so forth so um, that capability is available um, as i indicated in the presentation our model of providing services to the to the quantum ecosystem is that we think integrating that capability with hybrid micro-optic packaging is a critical step to really make uh, quantum component, laser-based components uh, scalable. So where we don't do dye by itself uh, to customers, um, we take the whole problem on and put next to the dye and even in the dye, um, what you might need depending on your system application. But uh, it certainly has the capacity, especially um, given that it's an ex telecom fab. So it has plenty of capacity to serve the quantum need with respect to the dye. Great, great. Thanks, Tim. Okay, let's move on to the next question here. So I want to start, I want to start with uh, Rujav again. So, you know, so in terms of IP, right? So when providing, you know, when working with customers, sometimes the customers may have IP, um, sometimes you may have IP, sometimes you both may have IP. How are you dealing with this? What are the pros, cons, and challenges of, of, in terms of IP contamination and, and how do you handle it? Sure, uh, great question. This is actually something that uh, we also uh, encountered with our internal designs as well, you know, juggling multiple internal projects. So um, it, at least it, the way our foundry services work is, you know, whatever designs a customer submits, that is their IP. So whatever GDS files, whatever design files, CAD files, et cetera, they submit are the customer's IP. Our fab process, like you know, the, the device layers that we use, how we manufacture them, the various etch and liftoff processes, et cetera, those are our IP. 
Um, when the customer does submit their designs, uh, they're stored on a, on a secure server in the same location that our, our internal design files are stored actually. So, uh, so we treat the customer designs with the same level of uh, you know, security rigor that we would our own, our own designs. Um, when these, you know, when the customer devices are manufactured on a wafer, uh, the, the wafer never, you know, leaves our, our fabrication facility. Um, in between the completion of the wafer and submitting the, uh, you know, sending the, the DICE devices to the customer, uh, there is some quality assurance that's done. That's typically done by a small team um, that, you know, their, their purpose is to uh, validate these customer designs. Um, so I think there's a couple of key uh, factors that are important for any any foundry to keep in mind, especially as uh, you know we uh, folks onboard more external customers and they might go towards an MPW um, uh, setup where there's multiple customers devices on the same wafer. Um, it's very important to to make sure that there's no cross contamination or IP risk of uh, of having those same devices on the wafer. So we we've developed a you know a, a software oriented method to establish those safeguards. Um, but I think that is something really important that every foundry is going to need to keep in mind. Great, great. Thank you. And then I, I want to pop over to Dirk now. Dirk, you know, you, you had mentioned uh, that, that there's been lessons learned in the semiconductor industry on how to handle this sort of thing, right? Do you have an opinion yeah. on that? I mean, obviously, I mean, in semiconductor, I mean, IP, it's not just that you're isolating the IP between the various people joining in on the multi-project wafer shuttle. But when I'm taping out today, I'm using certain IP blocks like my digital library actually comes from an, another vendor, which is actually not a global foundry, but it's in this case, Invercast, and also sometimes you're getting ARM library. So actually it's like third parties providing you IP or using within global foundries. And the way it's actually done is that global foundries is paying towards these guys and basically then charges us to me. So actually there is like IP, which is developed by somebody. And it could also be if somebody wants to use certain block designs we have developed, you could basically lift our block design, use it in your design and put it together out into Global Foundry. And so there's a very interesting IP uh, landscape to be developed for um, quantum computers. And I think uh, here it's important that we actually find a way to do this efficiently and uh, with the right safeguards for everybody. But it has been done in the, I mean, nearly everybody went uh, and got fabless in silicon. There are very few people left over which own their own fab. And there is a very good reason for it, why this is actually economically more e efficient once the maturity is achieved. I think the deep vertical integration you see today is a result in quantum that we are pretty immature. That's the main reason. Right, right. I, can, I, can I, can I, I ask Christian? I was oh, just going to ask you to comment, Sherry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was I was just going to I was going to sort of second what Dirk said is that you know I think the development of an IP reuse library, the way that we have it out in um, you know electronics, is a really key thing so that you can take IP you know component libraries, circuit libraries, drivers that have been you know developed um, with one company, fabricate them in another company's found you know foundry. And then use them for your thing. That's it's really one of the things that's allowed the electronics world to be as flexible and to grow as much as it has. And I think that you know, for both you know quantum and for integrated photonics, it's really early days in terms of getting an IP market going. Um, and that that includes the devices, that includes the models, so that you can you know model your circuit and you can expect to get you know working working silicon or or silicon nitride or whatever it happens to be in this case on on the first try. Um, as you know, a lot of electronic circuits, they do one spin and they have a working device, you know, and that comes from, from a lot of, a lot of, you know, modeling infrastructure that has been built up. But this, right. uh, how, how is this all organized? Uh, for example, if you reduce IP developed by a third party for another customer, so what, what it's in for the third party, are they, are they getting royalties or how is they, they get royalty done? and the royalty gets collected by global foundries. 
So mm -hmm. actually, the way it is done, you basically watermark the devices on the on the reticle set, and that's actually supported by the CAT system. So basically, when I'm doing a digital synthesis and I'm doing the digital synthesis using the Invicast library, my digital library gets watermarked. So basically, the uh, features about what dummy cells have been injected gets modulated mm -hmm. so that it can be recognized. And then basically Global Foundry recognizes that this was happening. And then it's basically saying, hey, you were using this IP and this is basically notifying the IP supplier. And basically they actually collect the money and route it towards mm -hmm. the Invicast guys. Yeah. And it's worth noting that this is like an opt-in. It's not like the Foundry just like takes some IP from somebody and like lets everybody use it, right? So basically the IP, the Foundry will actually offer me the IP up. I decide that I want to use the library. So I sign up for the services. I actually do this in the uh, order form. And then actually in the order form, I'm saying I'm going to use the Invicast libraries and I'm going to use the ARM libraries. And then automatically when I'm ordering my MPW service, I'm also paying the NRE. And then when wafers gets produced, they automatically gets this upcharge gets, basically it's like an app store to some degree. Mm -hmm. Basically okay. just paying directly for the right. services yeah. you consumed. Okay, uh, so now, now I have another question. Let's say you have a relationship between a fabulous company and uh, and fab company, which also doing the particular product development. Let's say both companies developing memory and uh, one is fabulous, one is uh, fab, uh, owning fab and uh, the fabulous company orders fabrication services from uh, the, the fab company, uh, which also developing the similar product. So how to delineate IP, which um, they, they basically in the same business. Both. They're competing. It's a marketplace. You basically yes. compete for that. You actually get used. You can detect the use and the factory, basically the, 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 the in this case, Global Foundry, they, for instance, offer their own memory cell, or you can mm -hmm. get the memory cell from somebody else. And like but if, if case, somebody else says, I think, okay, I fabricated uh, memory in your factory and therefore, you know, our IP is contaminated. So uh, how to how to protect against that? Are, are you asking how do you stop the fab from basically, you know, ripping off somebody else's designs that's being fabbed through it? Or um, not, not just ripping off, but uh, just being to inspired make by. sure that nobody complain about that or let's say, this concern is somehow addressed. But it's, it's, uh, again, if lawyers gets into play, they say, if there is a possibility that somebody else looking at our IP, which is not available to somebody else, but you by fact that you fabricated our chips, you're exposed to this IP. So what, what to do? Not to take orders from this company? Or what? Right. Well, I think I think one thing that companies have done in the past, and, and there's some allusion to this in the, the chat, um, is you can try to firewall it, right? So the people that are doing the the fab and the people that are doing that device development don't both don't get to see the the IP, right? So you just you separate it by personnel. Um, there, for multi-project things, you know, people have used aggregators in some case, which are, are third-party people that hide all of the IP. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody sends their like mask files to a company and then they send the masks to the fab and the fab can't really necessarily look through all the masks to see what's there, right? It's not, it's not practical. Right. Um, but there is some amount of trust that's involved in this, mm -hmm. right? And for instance, that's, in that's, the project we are building up, we're looking a little bit in the early days of semiconductors, there was Moses as the fabrication service and Moses actually is run by University of Southern California. So it's kind of a neutral institute, which is the intermediator taking in the files and compiling them together. Mm -hmm. So in this case here, we're envisioning that Slack might pick up that, that function here, that they are basically aggregating the designs and bringing everybody together and make the IP available mm -hmm. and makes a neutral zone. 
Yeah, I think if I may very quickly interject, oh, I apologize. I'm not on the panel, but the, dis the discussion has come to a point where I feel like I can contribute meaningfully. So I was at TSMC for five years before I started my PhD. And TSMC, as you know, is um, very famous for like doing the pure play foundry. Um, so there what we used to do is we, we would have access to every company's IP, but there is such a strong firewall. And Oleg, I totally understand your concern. You do not partner with a company that does not have a firewall in place. We had such a strong firewall that I could not see what the what my uh, you know department-wise firewall simple you know like storage firewalls. There is zero access. Like we could not bring any personal device inside the foundry itself. Nobody can take anything out of the out of the uh, uh, TSMC's uh, email ID to an external one. Everything gets monitored because you, TSMC essentially becomes the bank for these IP that's coming in, and nobody. Mm -hmm. Trust TSMC. TSMC starts losing other people's IPs. So that's that's how it is. The trust is created. Like mm -hmm. Cheryl said, trust is very important. But you should partner with somebody who can who can guarantee that. Right. right. Yep. Yep. So let's let's continue on here. Um, so you know. So again, so founder type considerations. So what what is the? Uh, and I'm going to start again with with Rujad here. So what is the thought process behind choosing behind shared user facilities versus dedicated foundries? You know, we have foundries here that are doing six, you know, single flux quantum, quantum integrated circuits, photonics, um, others. Um, so what is the thought process? Sure, uh, just, just a quick question. It's you, Raj, but uh, no, no problem you. there. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is actually something that uh, goes back to, to the heart of how Rigetti started. So we, we were founded in 2013 at, without a fab, obviously, and we did all of our fabrication uh, at University of California Berkeley's Nano Lab. Uh, we had to outsource some key steps to UCSD. We outsourced some other key steps to U Chicago. So it was a lot of you know, juggling processes done at different shared user facilities. And you can imagine how hard it was to get our first uh, AQ uh, QPU deployed, uh, you know, juggling all these different processes. So we're, we're keenly aware of, of you know, what it takes to, uh, to establish a reliable and repeatable uh, fabrication process, especially for devices that are as sensitive to you know, microscopic or nanoscale defects such as quantum integrated circuits. Um, so I, I think you know, one thing that has come up as you know, Rigetti has started our own foundry services is uh, there are still um, academic institutions or academic research groups, as well as research groups at national labs uh, that still opt to use the shared use facilities. Um, obviously, cost is you know a big factor there. Uh, grad student labor is uh, not as expensive as going to a foundry. Um, but you know some of the cons with a shared use facility are you don't really have control over what materials are going in that tool. There might be you know dozens of other folks using the same tools um, with different you know material contaminations. You don't really know the process history of the tool, what its you know PM schedule is. Uh, so you know at least in in our our mindset was, you know, it, if you're looking to make superconducting quantum circuits, it makes sense to do that at a fabrication facility that has been purpose built for superconducting materials processing. Uh, you know, every tool in our fab has been has been cherry picked uh, to to make our QPUs. Um, so this is actually a question that uh, I would love to hear from you know some folks in the audience. What are other than cost? What are some of the the reasons academic folks might decide to use a university clean room or some, some other shaders facility? Uh, as opposed to a dedicated foundry such as ours or CQCs, et cetera? Yeah, so let, let's come back to that. I, I'd like to get Oleg from Seek, uh, who joined us late, uh, to, to answer this question as well, if you would, if you'd like to. Still there, uh, Oleg? Yeah. yeah, 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 I'm here. Well, uh, you see, the SFQ process is uh, quite complicated. It's a multi-layer process. So even if uh, people would like to use share facility, it takes a lot of effort to port the uh, entire process there. And uh, the reality is such that uh, uh, when uh, the, prog uh, the progress in single flux quantum uh, circuit just started, that was many years ago, it was done in various research facilities and universities and so on and so forth, but only very small circuit could have been done there. So th therefore quickly the uh, consolidation happened and now SFQ circuit can be built only at SIG 
in Japanese uh, metrology institute called AIST and also MIT Lincoln Lab. But uh, Japanese and Lincoln Lab facilities are for government uh, project uh, participants only. So the only commercial path is, uh, is SEEK. And also there is another one uh, which DWAF is using, it's called Skywaters, uh, but the uh, price, uh, price tag is pretty high there. You have to buy, uh, you have to pay a lot of money, which may not be affordable for the regular researchers in university, for example. So that is why in, uh, in our case, it's, uh, it's very simple. You just don't have availability of such processes anywhere else except very few places and, uh, and the price differential is quite high or access differential such as as I mentioned Lincoln Lab only That's accept uh, customers from our uh, government projects. Great, great, thank you Oleg. Tim Day, do you want to make a comment on Photonic? Well, with respect to you know, you know using a shared you know, so if you have an application and you need to get uh, you know similar devices to what you're talking about and in your you know as you're a customer of yours would be you know potentially going to UC Santa Barbara as a shared user facility right. or you know going to you which is a dedicated foundry at what point does that start to make sense for the customer well, I think it makes sense, you know, again, relative to the overview that we gave, I think it makes sense when you want to optimize the design of the die together with optimizing the subsystem that it goes into. Um, this industry, Daylight, does quite a bit of work for the U.S. government already. We're, we're about, I think, 3,000 modules that use die plus uh, subsystems wrapped around them uh, per year. And um, so... I think it makes sense now um, because we've gotten to a point where it's clear in the quantum community that optimizing swap and systems integration and scaling for commercial is upon us. Um, a facility that has the same fab for all modules, if you will, is very doable. Um, we do uh, probably a hundred million of US government business and firewalling so that the products that ship to customer A are unique and um, firewalled from the products that ship to customer B is, is very doable. Those practices are in place. And yet, you know, the fab, and at least in the case of laser sources for quantum, doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of the proprietary content for us. It's really up uh, in the module and the system that's unique to the customer. So, you know, a, a 10, 13 nanometer uh, semiconductor laser that might be useful for cold atoms um, is a fairly standard, you know, in gas piece of technology. So everybody can use that capability and customize at the module level, which is a dedicated product line. So I think it makes sense now. I think it's fairly straightforward to firewall. I think it's done all the time in uh, US government and defense programs. And uh, there's a pretty mature industry that can help the customers with that. Great, thank you, Tim. I want to go back to, uh, I, we're sort of running out of time now. Um, Celia, you asked a question in the chat, is this uh, in terms of the IP? Uh, and actually the question was more, it kind of expanded uh, with, with the great dialogue we had going on. But you know, the original question was sort of, should there be an IP marketplace for various players in the quantum enabling ecosystem so that multiple parties can sort of access each other's and monetize their own when they're game to do that? And you asked the question, Celia, uh, it'd be great if you just came out and talked about it. Is this something QDC should be helping out with? Yeah, and I think my camera may be hijacked by another app, but um, I, I just, in, in sort of the beginning of that conversation, talking about how it could be helpful for there to be mechanisms for sharing IP, that just seems like something that an organization like QEDC could help to launch. You know, we don't need to own it. I, I'm just curious if anyone knows how that got started in other industries like microelectronics. Was it kind of always done by some commercial outfit? Was it a Moses um, uh, sort of spin out or capability that um, was institute or became part of the industry going forward? Because we've talked about the possible need for something like Moses. Maybe this is a piece of what that might include. 
Yeah. Uh, Dirk, you, you had mentioned two other platforms as well for the semiconductor industry, right? Well, so basically, I think Moses is one of the big ones, which was basically actually a US government uh, institute, basically, and they basically got the order to provide multi project wafer services to a lot of uh, uh, commercial customers, and they started this fabulous model. Uh, in Europe, there is Euro practice, which is doing the same thing for Europe. Uh, for silicon devices. So there are a couple of examples where people successfully build up these marketplaces and where you can go to and basically get this done. And I think you're going to need something similar here. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to go to the uh, schedule. Um, so we completed the fabrication services today and we're looking to do quantum electronics and RF uh, on December 2nd. And then we're gonna migrate to test and measurements. And then we're looking at bringing on uh, quantum computing software and quantum computing hardware companies um, in, in the early part of next year. Thank you very much. Celia, you wanna have any closing remarks? No, I want to thank everyone who presented today. I think this is a really important piece of the, the whole innovation ecosystem. It can really, as, as was pointed out, uh, not everybody wants or needs to be able to fabricate their own uh, devices and technologies. And um, so figuring out how to get everybody connected so that innovation can happen more rapidly is what we're all about here. So thank you for your presentation. And um, you know, those of you who have videos up on the website, you can point people to the QEDC platform now or, or go directly to the YouTube channel. So hopefully um, we'll be continuing to raise awareness about uh, what QEDC members are doing. So thank you everybody.